Hi, I'm Steve Clemens, and today I have two questions. First, is NATO succeeding in walking the fine line between defending Ukraine and direct confrontation with Russia? And later in the show, what's going on in President Zelensky's mind these days? Let's get to the bottom line. One of the major effects of the war in Ukraine is that it has revived NATO. Just a couple of years ago, the alliance of Western countries was being bashed on a daily basis by former U.S. President Donald Trump, who constantly said that America pays too much to defend Europe. But now the U.S. government has poured billions into Ukraine, and President Joe Biden has asked for another $33 billion. The flow of weapons from the West to Ukraine is the biggest supply since World War II. But all of this also comes at the expense of Europe's stability, which was the point of creating NATO in the first place. Moscow is now demanding that NATO stop supplying weapons to Ukraine and stop trying to recruit more Eastern European countries to the pro-Western alliance. So what should we expect in the coming months, especially as the war drags on with no end in sight? Today we're talking with the Deputy Secretary General of NATO, Mircea Giona, a diplomat and politician from Romania who served as his country's foreign minister and president of the Senate. Deputy Secretary General, thank you so much for joining us. I want to ask you right now, as we watch the intensity of fighting uh, in Ukraine, we see this crisis, we see the escalation in rhetoric from people like Russian Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov. Is NATO ready for a potential escalation? If this war spills into NATO territory, how will NATO respond? We are indeed entering a decisive stage of the war that Russia has waged against Ukraine in the Donbas, in the south. So we anticipate the next few weeks to be really decisive, even if the war could really drag on for a longer period of time. For the time being, other than the, the rhetoric, uh, which we condemn uh, by Russian leaders, we do not see in military terms indications for Russia willing or able to escalate uh, the situation with NATO. Probably the fact that NATO has been mobilizing uh, significant additional forces on the eastern flank, that we have activating for the first time in history uh, the uh, defense plans for, for the eastern flank countries, um, is a significant symbol of deterrence and strength of the alliance. So the war probably will, will rage on even more intensely, with even more casualties, with more sacrifice. But at this time in point, we do not see a risk of escalation between Russia and NATO. And we are also trying to avoid an escalation between NATO and Russia. Look, I cannot imagine how complex your job is. There are a lot of members of NATO. There are new ones like Finland and Sweden that are talking about joining. Uh, that's still on the table for um, other states as well. I think before this crisis, NATO was kind of taken for granted. I think people felt NATO's there. But now we see a new purpose. We see a revived sense of purpose of that alliance. How healthy is it? Tell us about the inner workings that you have to deal with every day with these different delegations, different militaries. I just love to give our audience a sense of the inner picture. I, I, I've been in this in this game and in this line of war for many years, as you as you said, Steve. I've never seen NATO so united. I've never seen a common sense of purpose. And in a way, this, this war that, that uh, Russia waged against Ukraine galvanized, in a way, NATO, but also public opinions. Something that I think is just extraordinary is not only the fact in which governments, U.S. government, England, U.K., Romania, whatever, NATO, Jens Stoltenberg, myself, were reacting to this crisis in a very professional and united way, but our public opinions, our businesses. When Russia uh, waged a cyber attack against a uh, Ukrainian satellite providing telecom and internet to Ukraine, all of a sudden an American private company came to the rescue. We are seeing NGOs raising money for, for, for Ukrainian refugees. So what I think is just r remarkable is not only the political or military side of NATO regalvanized, but our democracies, our public opinions, our businesses, our citizenry. And this is something I believe is nothing short of formidable. And we hope to keep this momentum uh, going forward. Has there been a kind of, I, I don't know how to put it otherwise, than a kind of polite surprise at the resilience of uh, the Ukrainians after this invasion, uh, a polite surprise about Volodymyr Zelensky's uh, resilience in this moment and his leadership? We have been training as NATO or NATO countries individually the armed forces of Ukraine since 2014. 
after the illegal annexation of Crimea and the occupation of the eastern part of the Donbass. So we knew that Ukraine, as a military, has been transformed into a quasi-NATO standard, while Russia has remained as a post-Soviet army. And I think that the difference in command and control, in, in, in the quality of, uh, of leadership in the military was not something that surprised us. But I think everything was surprised by the immense bravery of Ukrainian people as a whole, beyond the military. The fantastic communi communication skills and heroism by President Zelensky and his team. So this is where I say we were pleasantly surprised by the resolve, uh, by the uh, level of sacrifice, by the level of, of, of ambition to defend their land. This is where we are surprised. But in terms of the transformation of the Ukrainian armed forces, we are not surprised because they are already a modern army. And with the support they get from NATO allies, they are becoming even more formidable, formidable as we speak. And this is our intention to continue to help Ukraine in its just fight against uh, the aggression of Russia. Richie, I'm going to take the liberty of asking you a question not about NATO. I mean, you and I have known each other for many, many years, and you're a leading uh, face of, of, you know, Romanian civil society and civic engagement. You've been president of the Senate there, foreign minister, ambassador there. I'm just interested in how this crisis has changed how an average Romanian citizen feels about their place, because they're pretty close to Russia. They're also part of NATO. But has it changed the internal dynamic of identity and how Romanians feel in this moment? You know, many of the younger generations um, were taking democracy and freedom for granted, in a way, because we are part of NATO, because we are part of the European Union, because we are part of, of, of the Western family of nations. But I think this war is, was also a brutal wake-up call for many of our citizens, not only in Romania, I think all the countries in the eastern flank, but even more importantly, for countries in Western Europe. Germany, look at the sea change of the public attitude and the strategic culture in Berlin, which was absolutely formidable. Look at the change in Italy, look at the change in France, in the US, in, in, in Canada, in the UK. So I think for all of us, newcomers into NATO, like my country, all the members of NATO from the very beginning, we were basically in, in, in face of the reality and the brutal reality that war is possible in Europe, something we considered will never happen again after the Second World War. And look, war is back in Europe. So in a way, this is a, a drama for the Ukrainians and for Europe, but it's also a fantastic wake-up call as sort of re renewing our vows to democracy and NATO and security. And that's how my fellow Romanians feel. We are so lucky to be in NATO. We are so lucky to be in the EU. And we have the obligation to help the Ukrainians down down the legitimate way to join us in the European Union. Let me just ask you finally, Mr. Deputy Secretary General, and first, thank you for your service and what you're doing and for joining us today. Um, I know in November that you were hoping that the Russians would agree to an honest dialogue to defuse tensions, that they would go there. We haven't seen that take part. I don't know our way out of this, but one of the obvious questions is, is this now a permanent new Cold War? where we have essentially another dark line uh, across nations and their futures, as we've seen how sanctioned Russia is today. We see other complicit nations with, with what Russia is doing in Belarus and others. You lived on the other side of that wall uh, with the West, from the West, when you grew up. And so you know a lot about walls and you know a lot about bleakness when it comes to futures. What is your sense, uh, what does your gut tell you is this something now we're going to be at for decades ahead? Or do you see any off-ramp in the near term where we can avoid that dark future of another harsh line between Russia and its interests and the rest of the world? It is no mystery that uh, the Russia, NATO, Russia, uh, America, Russia, and Europe, Europe relationship is the lowest point in many decades. That's a fact. And as long as Russia will continue to be an aggressive uh, uh, player, will occupy its neighbors illegally, of course, the relationship will stay at a very low level. At the same time, we are not in the business of ruling out a future relationship with Russia, which is a big country, a great people, a great history, great culture. 
So when Russia will realize that this is not the way to approach uh, European security and to engage its neighbors and, and its partners in Europe, I do not rule out a moment in time, I don't know when, mm. but the moment in time when things will, if not come back to normal, when some form of, 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 uh, of dialogue with Russia would resume. But as long as they occupy uh, territories, they behave like they behave, will be very difficult for us to, to, to do that. But again, we are not ruling out that in the future, in a moment, of Russia's choosing in a way. When they change course, I, I, I know that we'll be ready to re-engage with them once they've been changing the way in which they approach uh, security, politics, and also values. And this is something very important for NATO. Deputy Secretary General of NATO, Mircea Giona, thanks so much for your candid thoughts and joining us today. Now we turn to the issue of what's going on inside the head of Ukrainian President Vladimir Zelensky these days. And we're fortunate to be talking with a journalist who shadowed Zelensky's team for two weeks and interviewed him in his compound in Kiev. Simon Schuster is a correspondent for Time magazine, and his cover story comes out this week, How Zelensky Leads. Simon, it's an incredible uh, bit of reporting. I had chills reading what you were sharing about being with uh, Ukraine's president under extraordinary circumstances. You were there. I guess my first comment to you is, you know, get, you know share with our viewers right now what the sense of that is. And I would also just ask you as a, you know, uh, a fellow in this, how have... How has your reporting in this incredible, let me put here, you know, in Time magazine, it's just a, this incredible document not shared with the Russians his habits and where he's going? Um, so, uh, yeah, as, as you said, I've, I've spent about two weeks um, basically with, with the, the, the president's team at the presidential compound. Um, he hasn't made any secret of where he is. That's one thing that, that uh, really surprised me from the beginning of the invasion. On day two, he posted a video of himself uh, standing outside in the courtyard um, of the presidential compound there in Kiev on Bankova Street. Um, and when I saw that video, I was like, what? what? He's still there? What is he doing? How has he not run? Um, but that was the, the message of the video, uh, that... He is not running. He's not going away. Uh, there's been no secret as to where he is. Um, and, you know, the, his message uh, explicitly and implicitly to the Russians is, you know, come and get me. I'm, I'm not going anywhere. Um, so, so my, my uh, request to, to him and his team was to uh, go in there and, and essentially um, see what their uh, life has been like, right. how they experienced right. this war. Um, and, and they uh, allowed me to do that. You, know, you interviewed him and you knew him when he was a comedian, uh, which was a fascinating bit of background that you had with him personally. What are some of the changes you've seen since the invasion of Ukraine and since his remarkable leadership uh, in these horrible circumstances? Yeah, I, I, I've been lucky enough to know him um, for about three years. I, I first profiled him for a, a piece in Time magazine uh, at the time, not a cover story. Um, when he ran for president in 2019, it was a bit of a quirky story, um, not not a, a, a huge one as far as the global news agenda. A comedian running for president, and uh, you know, emerging in the in the polls as the likely winner. So I went to Kiev at the time, and I met him um, backstage of his comedy show, which was kind of doubling as his campaign uh, platform, his campaign rally. Um, it was a, a, a variety show in Kiev where he was the star. There was singing and dancing and, and uh, sketch acts and things like that. Um, so, of course, you know, the, the Zelensky I met backstage of that show uh, was a very different person uh, than, than the one that we've seen, you know, in, in this invasion. At the time, he was um, quite naive about politics generally. Um, he was very optimistic and confident in his ability to you know, find a way to uh, strike a peace deal or reach reach some kind of accord with Vladimir Putin and Russia. And indeed, he tried to do that for the first two years of his tenure as president after he won those elections. Um, he grew more and more disillusioned with the possibility of doing that in those two years. And then, you know, since the invasion, it's it's a, a, a very different man. He's, he's grown a lot more um, hard, uh, tougher, you could say, um, in some ways much more confident in, in his um, 
his own sense of his, 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 his role as a leader. Um, he doesn't doubt himself as much as I saw him uh, doing in earlier interviews. Um, so this, this interview for this cover was my, my fourth interview with him over his career mm. as a politician. Um, and, and the changes have been, you know, pretty interesting to observe and, and, and dramatic in, in this pretty extraordinary career he's had. We know that Ukraine is a divided country or was a divided country in some ways. What have been those that sort of thought they were tilting, wanted to tilt more towards Russia? Have they been moved by seeing this invasion? Are they impressed now with Zelensky? Have you talked to people that might not all have been in lockstep but, but before President Zelensky, before this invasion? Um, yes, uh, I, I don't think, uh, honestly, that um, group of voters um, will make up a significant block, you know, at, at the end of this war. I, mm -hmm. I think the invasion has absolutely disgusted everyone um, I spoke to who may have been more open to uh, some kind of restoration of normal relations with Russia in the past. Um, that's all over. You know, there, there was maybe a, a constituency um, that you could say was pro-Russian um, before this invasion. There was certainly a, a significant party in the parliament of Ukraine that represented um, in some ways Russia's interests or acted as, as a, a proxy or a stand-in for, for Russia and its talking points politically in Ukraine. Mm. Um, that party is, is essentially gone as, as, a, as a political player. Um, I don't think it has a power base anymore. I mean, think about it. So Russia promised or claimed that it was invading Ukraine in order to save the people of eastern Ukraine, <clears throat> the regions of the country where, uh, you know, people say they're, they're more kind of Russia-leaning voters. But what's happened to those regions? They've been totally decimated by this war. Thousands of people have been killed by this invasion who were supposedly, you know, the, the, the electorate of, of the pro-Russian forces in the Ukrainian parliament. So there, there's just there's not a leg to stand on politically after this conflict, during this conflict, for any politician in Ukraine who says, um, you know, let's let's get along with Russia and let's make nice and let's let's uh, try to try to, you know, follow some of Vladimir Putin's ideas about what Ukraine needs to look like. The, those days are over. I, I don't think there's any realistic scenario where uh, Russia has a kind of political vehicle for for pursuing its interests inside Ukrainian politics af after this is done. Now, you know, you're a real reporter. You're in the middle of it. You can you can take firsthand reporting. But we're seeing the signals and I'm interested in information and what the North Star is in a mo at a moment when uh, there is there are major efforts at disinformation out there. But but when you're in the middle of this and you see, you know, uh, President Zelensky wanting to raise the hopes of people, how do you yourself advise people who are looking at this to be able to separate fact from fiction? Hmm. Um, that, that's that's tough. I mean, I report what I uh, hear from reliable sources mm. and know to be true. I, again, I'm, I'm not sure it's it's my uh, role to educate your viewers or or my readers in media literacy. Um, I, I I hope they <laughs> read and watch reliable sources of information. Um, you know, I, I think uh, yeah, every side in in a war generally tries to win over the hearts and minds of of uh, the other side and the global community that's watching the conflict. Um, President Zelensky has certainly devoted uh, a lot of his time. You know, when I was there, um, uh, hanging around the presidential compound, you know, I'd, I'd say the bulk of his time is is devoted to what you might call, um, you know, communication strategy, right? Giving speeches, uh, writing speeches, um, meeting with foreign leaders, uh, addressing, you know, various venues from uh, the, the Parliament of South Korea. Right, I mean the World Bank. Um, he he spoke at the Grammy Awards. Um, so all of these things you could perhaps cynically classify as, as part of the information front in this in this conflict. But yes, he's he's trying to get his message across um, as as forcefully as he can because he knows that his ability to do that, his ability to grasp and hold the world's attention uh, and maintain the support of the world, uh, will in many ways determine whether his country lives or dies. Um, and he's been doing a pretty good job at, uh, at, at keeping the world uh, engaged and, and, and supportive of Ukraine. Um, does he worry that, that he may not be on the cover of Time magazine um, as frequently as he needs to be to, to maintain attention? 
Yeah, that's definitely a concern he has. Um, the last time we sat down, um, I think it was April 19th, um, he uh, asked me whether I felt that the uh, the world's attention was was flagging. Um, uh, so it's, it's clearly a concern. You know, he's, he said that uh, he, he thinks a lot about how um, people outside of Ukraine perceive this conflict, uh, understand this conflict mostly through social media, hmm. uh, through outlets like, you know, Instagram, on their Instagram feeds. Uh, and he expressed this concern that, you know, the, the war has been so horrifying to, to observe, to watch. You know, as, as he put it, there's a lot of blood and there's a lot of emotion. Uh, and he felt the concern that eventually uh, people would just start to turn away because it was just, un, you know, unbearable to watch. It, it's just this constant stream of, of, uh, of, of pain, atrocities, you know, uh, bombings, cities and communities being destroyed. Uh, and he was concerned that the international community and, and uh, international leaders would just eventually not not be able to to uh, take it anymore. Would would essentially right. turn away, close their eyes, um, and that he said, you know, is, is a real danger for Ukraine. You know, another thing that he shared with you, um, and it was so interesting to read it in such raw form, that he himself worries that his military will be crushed by the Russian military, so much larger. Does he think that it, the supplies and systems that are coming in can preclude that fear that his own military will be crushed by the Russians? I, I think broadly, you know, the sense I got from him and, and uh, his closest advisors is they're very confident in, in their own ability to win. I mean, they understand the risks. They understand the risks of Russia dropping, uh, you know, some enormous bomb on the compound where they live and work. They understand the risks that their armies will be um, surrounded and, and, and partly or completely defeated uh, in the battle for eastern Ukraine that, that just is ongoing now. Uh, the level of morale in society and in the military is extremely high. It's extremely high among Zelensky and his advisors. Mm. Um, I think as a corollary to that, there isn't a huge enthusiasm for uh, jumping headlong into peace talks with Russia hmm. on the Ukrainian side. So I, I do think that, uh, and, and Zelensky said this in, in no uncertain terms, that uh, the outcome of this current battle for eastern Ukraine will in many ways shape uh, our dialogue at the negotiating table. Uh, to put that more simply, um, you know, let's, let's see how well we can do in pushing the Russians back militarily uh, and depending on the outcome of those battles, we'll, we'll see where we stand at, on the, at the negotiating table. Well, we're going to have to leave it there. Time magazine correspondent Simon Schuster, fresh back from Kiev. Extraordinary reporting. I highly recommend people take a look at how Zelensky leads. It's the cover story of Time magazine uh, right now. Uh, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. So what's the bottom line? Regardless of what you think of the war in Ukraine, you really have to hand it to President Zelensky. He's a guy who started out as a comic until three years ago, and now he's looked upon by his partners in America and Europe as a kind of Churchillian figure, keeping hope alive even in the darkest days. But here's the rub. This war has gone from a sprint to a marathon, and the world is a massive case of ADD, or attention deficit disorder. So what happens when people start skipping over the Ukraine videos on their phones? Is it game over for Zelensky and his vision for Ukraine? Does Zelensky have to be the entertainer indefinitely? Or will the West find the resolve to commit itself for the long haul no matter what? The future of what it means to be a sovereign state is what is at stake. And that's the bottom line.